Imagine, if you will, a city, a golden city, a city whose name is as shrouded in myth as its streets are in mist, a city poised on the edge of the old world, and that edge is spinning further away, its history being eaten at by fashionable invention and a fashionable shame for the sins of the long dead, which built the finery that once adorned the city. Congo Square, the foreboding symbol of that city's shame, once sat virtually on the same spot as Louis Armstrong Park, named for the largest looming symbol of the city's pride. It is a city that, like the river that runs through it, carries the currents of a thousand streams, blending them and discharging them into a vast ocean. It is the city that care forgot and that the world forgives, a vanishing city, both under myth and misfortune. It is a musical city, perhaps the greatest musical city in the world, a city where the greatest American music was born and where now it seemingly exists only as a pale and sterilized fodder for tourists. This is the righteous Bojambo. This is New Orleans. And this is the story of its four kings. Logic and laziness tend to suggest that jazz is the little brother or the first cousin of the blues. It isn't. It's more like the rowdy neighbour who breaks into the blues house all the time and borrows stuff that it doesn't really return. Of course, jazz also lived next door to the church house and the concert hall and the whorehouse and the city hall. And that neighbourhood which nascent jazz was able to ransack was thrown together through accidents of racism, spoils of war, bad town planning and blurred and distant geopolitics in the blink of an eye. While the blues was a slow accretion and evolution over hundreds of years and two continents, jazz arose through a series of accidents, a music made by the fallout of the Tower of Babel and emerged seemingly whole-born within about seven years. Behind jazz, as there is with the blues, the deep and dismal story of slavery dwells, and within that, he attempts to keep alive the multifarious threads of cultures dragged with the slave ships, stands as a secret beacon which kept alive the humanity and the mental vestiges of freedom. The last thing I want to do here is apply or assay any form of moral equivalency around the different stripes and flavours of slavery. I just want to ascribe in a very short period of time the broad causes and circumstances and coincidences which made New Orleans the birthplace of jazz. Africans first arrived in New Orleans in 1719, a mere year after the foundation of the city. In 1724, it was decreed that slavery in Louisiana was to be regulated under the legal framework of Code Noir. Code Noir, in short, were 60 articles which laid down the limitations of actions on slave owners. The code covered rules around slave marriage, sexual relations and children, marriage, prohibited actions, the requirement of how owners were to treat slaves, how slaves were to be freed, and what rights they enjoyed after manumission. While still intolerably cruel and degrading, Code Noir was still considerably more humane than the various other codes which govern the rest of the USA. It also led to some interesting concessions that helped make the cultural lives for slaves richer and more opening to merging with other influences. Under Code Noir, slaves did not work Sundays. Ostensibly, this was so they could go to church, but that still left them Sunday afternoons, which they could put to use either running businesses, performing as paid entertainers, or socialising at mass dances held in Congo Square. Where the New Orleans City Council in 1817 specifically dedicated the square for African American dancers, which was an almost unheard of act of toleration. New Orleans has a storied history of European governance. First claimed by Robert La Salle for France along with the entire vast watershed of the Mississippi River in 1682, the city itself was founded in 1718 to head off Spanish commercial interests. The French then ceded it, rather gladly apparently, back to Spain in 1764. Napoleon then swindled them out of the territory in 1801 by enacting a treaty he didn't have the legal power to enact and sold, in one of the most brilliant deals of all time, the vast tract of land that formed the Louisiana Purchase, 
Most people look at the Louisiana Purchase and think Napoleon lost out on it, but in truth, he managed to sell territory he didn't own, couldn't govern, and could never keep because American settlers would inevitably press west and start homesteading on it, to someone who, in buying it, paid twice what they came to pay, although they didn't get three times the territory, and gave him a fortune to tool up for the war he was about to spend the next 12 years fighting. Luckily for civilization, he had to spend most of that money replacing a fleet that he promptly lost at the Battle of Trafalgar. <laughs> New Orleans was also the great melting pot of American society in the years leading up to World War I. Not just French dominated, it retained a strong notes of Spanish culture as well as German. For example, the characteristic New Orleans accent Yat has a strong German Yiddish roots similar to a Brooklyn accent. Dutch and Scotch-Irish, as well as natural-born American and Eastern immigrants, as well as a broad selection of African-American backgrounds. All of this multicultural influence meant that the music of New Orleans was, to play a trope, a veritable gumbo waiting simply for someone to apply the heat to the cooking pot. Another advantage of Code Noir, such as it was, was that slave masters were required to educate the children of slaves. Plus, no work Sundays meant the Sunday school was available to children and adults alike, and the opportunity to employ themselves meant that there was a viable black economy interacting with local commercial economy. This meant that there was a relatively large number of educated, economically independent and free African Americans in New Orleans community. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase, 15% of Louisiana's population was free African Americans. At the start of the Civil War, this was just over 20%, while for the state of Mississippi, it was less than 2%. Being a predominantly Catholic city, New Orleans' music was not as influenced by hymnody as was music in the predominantly Protestant states, so the music wasn't bound to the rigid song formats we'd later readily recognise as the blues. Which is not to say that even the most primitive New Orleans music is not easily identified as blues, but it has a very different music from the blues you might hear in neighbouring Mississippi. Also, in common with what we like to pigeonhole as the blues, the call and response format derived, so they say, from social messaging systems across fields, was structured and formalised in hypnotic influence into the vocal basis for the blues, whereas in jazz, which is primarily an instrumental form, it became the basis of the riff-based verses and the back and forth nature of soloing. For the sake of brevity, the finally huge differentiator between New Orleans jazz and the blues is the influence of Spanish music on jazz, particularly that brought by emigres from Cuba. Jelly Roll Morton called it the Spanish tinge. This rhythmic form, based on the habanera and tracio dance music, was a duple pulse beat which Morton claims, and Morton claimed a lot of things, to have altered by adding syncopation, thus giving New Orleans music its customary drive and swing. This largely discounts, however, the influence of ragtime, a form that had been floating around since before the Civil War, before being finally codified around the end of the 19th century. Melodically stilted, but rhythmically manic, it is impossible not to believe that musicians travelling on riverboats, either as entertainers or having taken other work on the boats, did not bring a ragtime influence downriver with them after trips to the epicentre of the genre, St Louis. It has been posited by Ted Goyer in his seminal history of jazz that ragtime was a greater influence on jazz in New Orleans than it was blues. The musical forces which combined to create jazz began to coalesce as New Orleans entered a period of decline. The city's population had quadrupled in the 50 years between 1825 and 1875, but was devastated by a yellow fever epidemic in 1878, and disease and pestilence were so rampant that average life expectancy was 36 years in 1880. Infant mortality sat at 45%. Is it any wonder that the city developed an obsession with funerals, memorials, parades and parties? And in an almost unique merger of the rituals of the profound and the profane, a form of jazz began to emerge across the city. In the squares, in the streets, the churches and in the fetid front rooms of bar rooms and bordellos, on Rampart Street and in fabled Storyville perhaps the most famous red light district in the world. As discussed in TRB 12, Americans have a seemingly inordinate need to decorate their musicians with the trappings and titles of royalty. 
As jazz emerged, one figure rose to the forefront of the new music, playing as he did in parades and at picnics, at parks and union halls, and at the honky-tonks that dotted the neighbourhood around City Hall. His name, say it in a reverent whisper, was Buddy Bolden, and he was the first of the four kings. Bolden was a shadowy figure. He left no recorded legacy and there's only one photograph of someone thought to be him. His name never even appeared in print until two years after he died. But his accomplishments and innovations were to lay the basis for not only an enduring American music, but an enduring mythos and code amongst its musicians. In short, these were that he was the first New Orleans street musician to begin to improvise extempore his solos. Players played faster and with greater technical proficiency before Bolden, but Bolden was the one who broke the music away from its classical bias in rote reading pieces to playing them, as they say, the way Buddy Bolden felt them. Bolden also introduced the single most defining element in the move from jazz away from being a march music to being a dance music, the big four beat, which gave the beat much more space for dances and was the basis of huge swathes of African American music, from Bo Diddley's Hambone to James Brown's Super Funk to Tony Williams's polyrhythmic masterclasses from 1967 to 68 with Miles Davis. Witnesses were inconsistent as to Bolden's tone. Some say he played sweet and languid, others say that he played hard and clipped, but they all agree on one thing, he played loud. It's probable his musical vocabulary went both ways, as he was also famed for pioneering the all-nighter, the furious dance music until midnight, and then slow, bluesy grinds to the dawn. So, in five years from around 1901 to 1906, Buddy Bolden wrote the rule book for jazz and became its king. And then came the fall. Through 1905 and 1906, Bolden's behaviour became increasingly erratic. He began to face high turnover in his band. He became paranoid, and worse still, the arrests for assault and disorderly behaviour began to mount up. This was blamed on his increasing intake of drink, but that only masked a more serious problem. He made his last ever public appearance as a musician on Labor Day 1906, but wandered off from the parade before he'd finished his set. By 1907, he was committed at the State Insane Asylum in Jackson, Louisiana. Full-blown schizophrenia had set in, and he spent the rest of his days there dying forgotten in 1931, aged 54. Bolden's successor as King was another mysterious and ornery customer, the fearsome Freddie Kapar. Kapar and Bolden's careers are to some extent inextricably intertwined, even though it's very possible the two men never met. What is clear is that Kapar, through his own self-publicity notwithstanding, was a phenomenal musician organising the Olympia Orchestra, a hot dance band in 1905 at the age of 15. The Olympia was a Creole band, so they had to be able to play to the downtown society crowd one night and then head uptown to play hot jazz. It wasn't actually called jazz until 1916 or so, later that evening. After a few years with the Olympia, Kapar, no doubt spurred by his legendary ego, joined Frankie Dusson's Eagle Band, the renamed Buddy Bolden Band, taking Bolden's place on cornet. Kapar's style was, they say, very close to Bolden's. Fearful of other musicians stealing his riffs, took to playing with a handkerchief across his left hand. By the turn of the decade, he was being billed as King Kapar. In late 1911, bassist Bill Johnson arranged a touring outfit to take the New Orleans Sound to Los Angeles and then Chicago and New York. Kepar agreed to the tour, billed as star cornetist. He lit out on the road and was seldom back in New Orleans after that. Besides some desultory notices in the New York papers, the tour was a huge success. RCA Victor in 1915 offered to make the original Creole band the first recorded jazz group, but Capard demurred, citing fear that folks would steal his stuff, and also cocking a snoot at the $25 flat recording fee, declaring he drank more than $25 worth of gin a day. Jazz wasn't recorded until 1917 when a group of white, largely Italian musicians called the Original Dixieland Jazz Band recorded the Original Dixieland Jazz Band One Step and Livery Stable Blues in New York. Livery Stable Blues was an old Freddie Kapar staple. Also in 1917, although some also say 1918, in Chicago Kapar lost his crown as king to Joe Oliver after a cutting contest, a one-on-one -on -one jam session where the winner is proclaimed by the crowd. 
He had another three good years though, as the original Creole band still toured relentlessly. But as New Orleans celebrated a new king, the old king gradually succumbed to alcoholism and tuberculosis, dying forgotten by all but a young kid called Louis Armstrong, who would always visit every time he came through Chicago, until that fateful day when Kapar passed away, aged only 43 years. Joe Oliver was one of the most profoundly influential musicians of all time, a brilliant trumpeter who added velocity and fluidity to the lexicon of the New Orleans plays. It was he who completed the pioneering work of Kapar in spreading jazz truly nationwide and became, along with Bessie Smith, the first maker of truly modern sounding jazz records, standards that are still played today. His career began when he was 27 years old, playing in increasingly more sophisticated marching bands and co-fronting a group with Kid Ori which was in demand for its hot dance music both up and downtown. It was a brawl that started at one of Oliver's gigs in Storyville that precipitated the Navy coming in and clearing the entire area, from Basin Street to the St. Louis No. 1 Cemetery in 1917. The loss of work from the closure of the cat houses led to the diaspora of musicians from New Orleans, largely to Chicago and St. Louis. Oliver packed his wife, his daughter, the rather superbly named Ruby Tuesday Oliver, and his cornet, and headed up Highway 51 for Chicago. Almost immediately upon arriving, legend has it, Oliver began taunting Freddie Kapar for the crown. There were other contenders at the time too, Buddy Petit, Emmett Hardy, Mutt Carey, guys who no one has ever heard of, or as in some cases like Hardy, never even heard. And by 1918 he'd won it, beating Kapar in a playoff and sentencing the former king to a slow and lonely decline. Oliver threw himself into recovery all of Kapar's old turf, Chicago, unsuccessful at first trips to New York and then California, all the while picking up the best of his hometown musicians. The brothers Johnny and Baby Dodds on clarinet and drums, the irrepressible Honoré Dupré on trombone, and one of the great women of jazz, Lil Harden on piano. But in July 1922, Oliver did something unheard of when he hired a second cornetist, a challenge to his star power, into the band. He sent a telegram to New Orleans to his 21-year-old protege and eventual successor, Louis Armstrong, asking for his immediate attendance in Chicago. Thus was born one of the great partnerships in American music. Oliver was not just a teacher and a guide to Armstrong, he was the surrogate father and the band the family that Louis so keenly longed for. Born in 1901 to a wastrel father and a 17-year-old mother, his father soon abandoned the family and his mother headed to Storyville to earn a living dumping Lewis to the care of an ailing grandmother. At 12, he was sent to the waif's home on a charge of disturbing the peace. He got 18 months and emerged a changed young man, the structure and discipline of the home having taught him a valuable lesson. His cornet playing had come ahead in leaps and bounds. Brass instruments were always cheap to come by in New Orleans because of the vast numbers looted from Cuba after the Spanish-American War of 1898. He went to work at backbreaking labour, hauling and delivering coal through Storyville, and was probably the only musician in town who was happy to see the place torn down. While many musicians left town after Storyville fell, Armstrong stuck around and found good gigs for a promising musician plentiful, most notably taking Joe Oliver's vacated spot on Oliver's recommendation, in Kid Ory's band, and a place with Honoré Dutre's brother Sam's Silver Leaf Band. The terrible sound of those old recordings notwithstanding, Oliver, Armstrong, Dutre and Dodds made some extraordinary music, engaging in almost telepathic interplay, especially at the moments of counterpoint, which became such a speciality it almost became a byword for their sound. The two cornets, Oliver's with his short, punchy fragments and subtle variations, the last sounding of the Buddy Bolton style before gluing them all together into guttural, hard-driving solos, frequently sonically altered by the use of mutes and plungers, and Armstrong with the then unheard of concept of swing, that knowledge of not just where the beat was, but where one fraction of a second off the beat was, and his beautifully unique sense of phrasing made him not only jazz's greatest soloist, but quite possibly the most influential soloist ever. Oliver and Armstrong were not only the peak of New Orleans jazz, but they were also its final golden sunset when, after carrying it from New Orleans to the world and perfecting its highest virtues of music, the interplay of the group, Oliver and Armstrong surpassed it and made it into the music of the solo, thus carrying it to its funerary beer. By 1924, the core band had split up because Oliver was a terrible money manager and the other cats suspected him of swindling them. Armstrong went off to Fletcher Henderson's orchestra, but he never forgot Papa Joe. 
Oliver's fall was longer and sadder than that of his predecessors. He began to develop chronic tooth and gum problems which diminished over the last 10 years of his life his ability to play. After a tough few years post the first band breakup, he formed the Dixie Syncopators more as a band leader than a player and began to work his way back up the ladder. But he was sacked from a stand at the Savoy Hotel after trying to negotiate a far too high a price. His place was taken by Fletcher Henderson's group featuring protege Louis Armstrong and he lost out of a gig at the Cotton Club by playing the same hardball, the gig going to Duke Ellington and launching him to stardom. Gradually his powers waned, he lost all his money in a bank collapse in the Great Depression and his reputation deserted him and he gave up playing music, living and dying in obscurity and penury, forced to sell off all his fine suits and horns in Savannah, Georgia in 1938. But Lewis never forgot him. It was he who paid for Oliver's body to be taken to New York and buried in Woodlawn Cemetery where Armstrong paid for the funeral of his idol and inspiration. Armstrong paid even one greater act of respect to Oliver. He never, ever referred to himself or allowed himself to be referred to as King Louis. As he said in his mind, Joe Oliver was still the king. And there we have it, Bolden, Kapar, Oliver and Armstrong. Four kings, albeit with one too modest to take up the crown. Four men on whose shoulders the early history of the great American musical form was lifted up, exalted, and on whose shoulders that music they invented was carried into history. A dynasty that went on from that which moved our music from a dependency on classic interplay to the age of the golden musical idea, the master soloist, and nothing would ever be the same again.